Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, Navigating the 2023 M&A Landscape. My name is Jessica Nels, and I am Head of Capital Markets at Churchill Asset Management. With me today, I am pleased to be joined by an all-star lineup, including Chris Ann Corbett, Co-Head of Industrials Investment Banking at KPMG Corporate Finance, Janica Lane, Co-Head of Consumer Investment Banking at Piper Sandler, Amy Peters, Partner of Corporate Finance and Investments at Canaan Spaulding, Christine Tiseo, Managing Director at Lincoln International, and Maria Watts, Co-Head of Global Consumer Investment Banking with Barrett. We have had three quarters of rather sporadic activity due to a variety of factors in lending. Deal flow has been uneven, leverage and pricing have been shifting, and fundraising has been challenging for some. That said, the market has been showing signs of improved sentiment. There is plenty of dry powder for lenders and private equity sponsors alike, and both are eager to put capital to work. We are here today to get the perspective from this impressive panel on the current environment and how we are thinking about the rest of this year and beyond. With that, I'd like to turn to Maria, if you could help us get some perspective on how the M&A landscape has evolved over the past year from the investment banking perspective. Thanks, Jessica, happy to do that. And we were just talking before the uh, panel started that it seems like the last week has been the most positive in terms of market and investor sentiment that we felt, felt all year. And that's definitely reflected in the numbers. So according to the stats for the middle market that we look at year to date through Q3, deal count was down 40% and deal value is off 36%. But uh, despite our best efforts to say that there was a bottoming in the first half of the year, it actually feels like it persisted through Q3. So really hoping for a better uh, Q4. And in the last six weeks, we've seen quite a bit of new activity, uh, both in terms of pitches and market launches. So we do feel like the market is improving, but it has been a choppy year to say the least. And can you give us a sense for how this has compared to 2022 so far? Yes. Yeah, so over overarching, it's down, you know, 35 to 40 percent. Uh, Baird, our, you know, we're focused in industrials, tech and services, consumer and healthcare. Uh, we've seen pretty um, different uh, levels of activity across the different sectors. And so uh, according to our information, consumer has been uh, the most challenged year to date. It's off about 56% uh, in deal count compared to last year, uh, then industrial, then tech and services, and then healthcare. Uh, we've seen pockets of activity and, uh, and interest in things like knowledge solutions, education, franchising, pharma services, outsource services, anything related to infrastructure, but it's still been spotty. And then flipping over to the credit side, Christine, yeah. could you provide some of your perspective on how M&A landscape has been shaped by credit and capital markets and specifically how have the credit and capital markets been performing um, so far this year and relative to last year? Um, sure, so I would echo a lot of what Maria said in terms of deal count around M&A. Um, and so maybe for hitting the credit markets, um, I'll hit on some broader um, market statistics that we track at Lincoln that are uh, all encompassing um, because it, it is composed of a database of, you know, in the thousands of companies um, out of our valuation group. Um, they, they collect and aggregate uh, just a vast amount of information that comes in uh, on the valuations they do for private credit funds when they mark to market the liquid debt securities. Um, and so when we aggregate the data, uh, what we saw in terms of M&A count, in terms of activity, when we were at the peak in, you know, call it sort of early to mid, uh, you know, in that 21, 22 period before the market really turned, uh, they recorded 285 transactions at the peak in one quarter. Uh, when you look at the number of transactions that were recorded in um, this last June quarter, um, they recorded 17 transactions. So it has been a dramatic fall off in uh, activity. Um, when you look at the EV multiples as well, which will feed into the debt, because I think part of the reason is, is the debt has driven down multiples. Um, the peak multiple in that same sort of time uh, period was around 13 and a half. 
Uh, now it's hovering at something that is about two turns below that. So still double digit, but um, you know, two turns below a, you know, 13 and a half, if you bought it at 13 and a half, is a pretty painful place to be. Um, and you know, currently with the EV fall off, so we've seen um, leverage uh, work their way down from an average peak of five and a half times to now um, somewhere in that four and a half times range. Um, and with that, we've seen equity cushions come up. So sponsors are having to over equitize um, to get deals done in those double di digit ranges in order um, to sort of compensate for the loss of about a turn of debt. So, so that's the bigger picture. Um, in terms of uh, sort of the market dynamics themselves, because there's been so few transactions, uh, our, you know, what we see is you know, increased competition among the lending platforms because they do have dry powder that they need to deploy. Um, and so, uh, and so we do see them competing on spreads and have seen spreads come down pretty materially from where they were when we hit the worst of it in Q4 of last year. Um, unfortunately, the feds have not um, uh, played ball and they've been raising rates at the same time that spreads have been declining. So all in, we're still seeing that the cost of capital continues to go up, even though spreads have um, come down, the all in cost of that capital has not improved. Um, and so on the economic terms, we are seeing, um, you know, it's less leverage, it's more expensive, you need more equity to get a deal done. But that said, if you think about all the other things that matter in a deal, um, you know, flexibility around getting things like DVTLs, uh, you know, EBITDA addbacks, covenants, everything is still pretty reasonable. We haven't really seen a lot of uh, walk back on those points. Um, so anyway, so all in the big in terms of big picture, the credit markets have impacted M&A activity substantially because um, they are down by turn. They are requiring higher equity checks um, and the cost of that capital um, is hard to absorb for the average company. Um, but if you can get past all that, the other deal terms are still quite borrower friendly in our view. And how has it been as far as soliciting interest from other lenders? Have you had to go broader? Are you finding some folks not comfortable providing leverage guidance? How has that process been working? Uh, so I think, um, yeah, and some groups are a little more reticent um, to sort of just give a view. And so they actually, we find them going through internal committee processes more often um, just to make sure that they don't overcommit their platform and under deliver uh, on the back end. Uh, we are finding that committees are more conservative. Um, and so while you might have a really good deal champion, um, there tends to be a lot of pushback at the IC level um, in terms of trying to get everyone to buy into the deal. And so while we don't believe the market is necessarily risk off as it was uh, once upon a time, I guess I would probably characterize it as risk cautious. Um, and so it's not everything that clears the bar. Um, the bar's not high, but it's not you know, low, <laughs> somewhere in between, vis-a-vis um, -vis where we were accustomed to having it uh, before the market turned on us. Thank you. And then flipping over to the current state of affairs or on the, the actual sales processes, Jenica, can you help us understand how an actual sales process has changed or not over the past 12 to 18 months specifically? Um, some questions might arise around, are deals being sourced differently? Is there a different level of interest from buyers? Are there different buyers in the mix? Um, the timing of the sale process or the diligence process, if you could give us some highlights on how that may have evolved over the past year or so. Sure. And I'll just caveat this with I spend most of my time in the consumer sector. So much of this will be most relevant to consumer and CPG, but I would say more broadly as well. Um, maybe just to start with the easiest part, in our world, what has not changed is we are still seeing strategic buyers in CPG and consumer more broadly still coming to the table. So they have remained active basically since a few months after the onset of COVID, and that seems to be a real positive dynamic in some of these processes. And then what has changed, I think you pointed to some of it, Jessica, but it's kind of everything else, but we'll try to put that into three big buckets. So one, I would say it is the types of companies coming to market, and you're going to hear this theme a lot in this conversation, I think, but it really is the A, A plus companies, and Chris Ann will get into that more as well. And I do think what it means to be an A company may have changed as well. Um, second approach to processes, has changed pretty significantly. The first one I would say is we are spending so much time upfront making sure that the right buyers, be they strategic or financial parties, are actually coming to the table. So most of you in these M&A processes have heard about these preview or fireside meetings. 
those are still definitely happening. And I'd say they're happening on almost every deal now. But in addition to that, we're spending a lot of time having earlier conversations to just seed or precede an opportunity with potential buyers and being a bit more iterative in the process thereafter about how we use that feedback to determine the process strategy. I'd also say preparation is intense as ever, and we're trying to come into every process better prepared. Sometimes what that is doing is translating into longer engagements with our clients, where maybe there's actually work that they need to do in the business before we can even kick off the process. And in every case, it's translating into so much time spent in the upfront prep, the third party work, and making sure that we have every bit of information from them that can tell the right story about the business. Um, I'd also say the buyer focus on profitability is making us coordinate much more of us between some of these third parties that are doing cost savings analysis and third parties doing quality of earnings work to make sure that all of that syncs up when we're thinking about what the EBITDA numbers actually are that we're bringing to the market. Um, to the earlier point that Christine made, we're also getting in front of lenders a lot earlier, often in advance of kicking off a process, just to understand, is that leverage read that we're going to get three times EBITDA, in which case we shouldn't go, or is it six times and we have a chance for a more premium valuation here? And then lastly, one big bucket, I would just say what buyers are looking for has definitely changed. And again, I think Chrisanne will cover this more, but what we're seeing in our world is more scale is better. So I would say 200 million is the new 100 million as it relates to minimum size on revenue that gets some of these buyers excited. And at the same time, they still want to see great growth and a great go forward opportunity in the business, even at that larger size. We're seeing a lot of dig in on unit volume growth as opposed to just dollar volume growth and a ton of dig in on profitability. And I think the expectation there is as high as it ever was, despite some of the headwinds around that. And every valuation is very grounded in EBITDA and cash flow. And I'd also add a lot of um, scrutiny as being given to the EBITDA addbacks that we're proposing and credit is not being given for all of them. At last, I'd just say all these buyers are looking for businesses that are incremental. So they they bring a new consumer and they, um, they compel additional purchasing in a category and really have a reason for being. And have you seen many processes that were maybe stalled or shelled in the prior year? I think that's one thing that maybe um, the difference between 2012 and 2022 and 2023 is that there were perhaps some processes that were contemplated in 2022 and were pulled because the market was so difficult then as well and maybe things are getting a little bit better and brighter. Had you seen some of those opportunities resurface and maybe not specifically in your industry, but just generally? You know, it really depends. So I would say some of the companies that have actually come back to market in 2023 were the ones that actually performed quite well in 22. Maybe they hit the numbers that were in their materials and the business has done well overall, but they just didn't get the buyers to show up last year or didn't get the value they expected. So I would say the good performers, some of them have had the opportunity to go back to market. Uh, less good performers or ones where maybe the buyer pool is just not that active. I would say maybe there's still a for sale sign hanging, but not an active process underway. I think that that bankers and companies are using a lot of discretion in terms of kicking off a new process because it really has to work the second time. And then one item you did touch on is the valuations. And that's something I think we had heard a lot about last year was the, the gap between buyer and seller expectations. Do you think that either that gap has um, has been getting tighter or perhaps there's some change in sentiment between the buyer or the seller as to what the actual valuation is, what, what is more realistic for evaluation? I feel like over the last several years, we've really been harping on our clients about the importance of profitability in particular, EBITDA and also cash flow, and that valuations really are grounded in that and that um, you know our client companies don't get a forward multiple when everybody else gets a backwards multiple and the comps are based on that. So I think there maybe there's a little bit of, of come to on valuation, but given what, what Christine said about you know the debt markets, pressure on value um, that are maybe causing some of the private equity values to come down and even increased cost of capital at some of the large strategics, I do still feel like um, every single process, you get to this point of indifference between the buyers and sellers where it's literally the lowest possible price at which a seller would transact and the highest possible price at which a buyer would transact, which does feel like a real sign of the times. And then scooching a little bit over to the actual specific industries, Chris Ann, can you give us some sense for um, how you determine which companies uh, to bring to market and then also 
maybe some of the industries um, that are, have been favored or fallen out of favor over the past year or so? Sure. And um, I think, uh, you know, Janica touched on a number of these items, but typically, you know, when we go to meet a client, whether it's a private client, a corporate client or a private equity client, one of the first questions we get, is this a good time to sell my company? And usually kind of break it into two buckets. What are the overall market conditions? Are they good? Obviously, 2023, that's been a much harder answer. It's been much more uh, challenging this year, given the rising interest rate, inflationary pressures. Um, a lot of companies have had a run up in, you know, revenue growth, post COVID bumps that you really have to dig in. Um, I think Janica touched on it. Um, what we look at with companies, if once we decide if, if like 2021, 2022, the market conditions was a very easy question. And then you, you know, we really look at how the company is performing, not just today, but what does the foreseeable future look like? So are there any big road bumps that we have to be aware of that could, um, impact, you know, buyer interest and valuation. I'd say a couple of things that we look at um, with a lot of companies right now is in, you know, the past couple of years, how has that revenue growth been achieved? Has it been all just price increases, which a lot of companies, I come from the industrial side, but I talked to a lot of my colleagues in consumer and services, or has it all been price increase? And if it's all been price increase, those that you're going to get some discount on your valuation because, you know, how sustainable is that revenue growth? So that's been looked at. Inventory levels are being very scrutinized right now. There's been a run up in inventory. There's a big destocking going on, you know, with a lot of industrial companies that has kind of impacted revenue for a number of companies um, in 2023. So we're, we look at all those factors. And then um, also, as mentioned, if we're getting ready to go to market, you don't want your EBITDA to be artificially high because of ad backs. You want your EBITDA to be as clean as possible. Less ad backs are honestly better because if there's too many ad backs, buyers get immediately turned off and don't want to sift through what's real and what's not real. So we kind of look at all those factors. And also in this market, we're also seeing a lot of companies coming to us and saying, you know, we're performing really well, but we weren't thinking about selling for several years. However, you know, we can't, you know, get up every day and we're not hearing, you know, uh, we feel pressure on technology, the technological innovation AI front. We've dealt with a lot of ge geopolitical uncertainty, rising interest rates, inflationary pressure, the tight labor supply we've seen over the last four years. So some companies are saying, you know, it's hard to manage through this. Maybe we partner up or sell now because it's going to be hard for us to navigate this through this over the next three to five years. So you have to kind of look at all the reasons a company is ready to sell. Make sure you, you, you see, as Janica mentioned, you know, that EBITDA is strong and secure. You can explain it. Um, and then lastly, that you really are on par with them on valuation. There is still valuation disparity between maybe what a banker might tell them and what the client thinks that their company's worth in the market. So you need to look at all those uh, factors. And then I would say on the in favor and out of favor, a lot of it comes down to just, you know, the company, how it's doing, we've performing, especially over the last, how they maybe came you know, out of COVID and performed, how they're performing maybe after, you know, some run up um, in the last two years. Paper side has been oil and gas. It's been very difficult to get deals done that have a strong oil and gas connection, especially given the whole ESG front. Um, we've seen, you know, industrial technology doing very well for us. And um, I believe it was uh, Janica that mentioned um, outsourced services have remained very strong. Anything that's like a must need service um, has performed quite well as well. Janica, do you have any other perspective on maybe some other industries based on your expertise that may or may may or may not have fallen in and out of favor? I would actually say if we go back to some of uh, what Christine and I talked about just around great companies, that that has probably dictated more than, than the actual sector in the consumer world, because I do feel like every sector of consumer has had its really dark challenges and its bright spots. Uh, for example, if you look at food or restaurants, food at home and away from home basically suffered the highest inflation uh, during this entire last three year period. And it was very hard to, to have positive comps, at least on a unit uh, volume basis. Um, hard goods, like Chris Ann said, tons of supply chain disruption, lumpy consumer spending has caused all sorts of interesting things with inventory and some inventory buildup. Uh, wellness services like fitness studios, Botox bars, they've actually rebounded quite a lot since COVID, but now they're sometimes viewed as too discretionary. And sectors like D2C e-commerce have had, had their challenges with iOS changes that decimated the landscape. 
um, the impression that none of these companies can make money because of the, the cat games that you have to play. But what we're basically seeing is the best companies in every one of those groups is getting deals done. So you saw Kava go public, for example, or Prelude invested in that skin farm, skin clinic, or Yasso sell to Unilever. So it really is going back to that theme of, of the A companies, regardless of sector. I mean, the one thing I, I would add to that that isn't necessarily sector specific, that I think if the, the negative cloud has passed, but for a period of time, the buying bills were out of favor. Because uh, when you are in a zero interest rate environment, you can finance a lot of those acquisitions, all debt, and continue to cash flow. But when your SOFA rate you know, goes from 1% to 5% um, and your EBITDA is all pro forma for unrealized synergies, the model doesn't hold anymore. And so we actually saw a lot of the buy and build um, segments, you know, healthcare, insurance, you know, all sorts of services, HVAC, um, were just really tough for a period of time. I think the, you know, people have sort of gotten them under control by using other forms of capital to delever those balance sheets. And so I've been able to continue to acquire by using what we call structured capital, which is really a hybrid security that sits between the last dollar of senior and the first dollar of common equity. It's an all pick security, It does, but it doesn't um, necessarily own equity. Um, it could be all pick, particularly if it's a, a note um, that has sort of come in to replace and um, you know what traditionally was financed with senior debt, but it took a little bit of time. So things that are very you know, dependent on financing to succeed as a thesis, um, I think would be one I would view as still you know, a little bit out of favor. That's an interesting point, and we'll get back to you, Christine, later on as we, um, we don't want to have a spoiler alert, but it was, as we talk through a little bit of the creative structures to get over that hurdle um, because of the conditions of the current lending environment. But before we do that, we'll talk quickly, or, or not quickly, but let's explore the fundraising and how that has had an impact both on um, private equity investments and the exit activity. Maria, if we can swing back to you and get your, your thoughts on that side. Sure. Uh, I don't envy the private equity community this year. Uh, it is on track to be the toughest fundraising environment in the last five years, and that includes uh, the COVID period where no one was leaving their house. So uh, that is unfortunate, and uh, it has made it is exacerbated exacerbated a lot of things. What we're hearing is that the main issue is the LPs are in a liquidity crunch because they're not getting the expected distributions that they typically would, so they cannot commit to re-upping or committing to new funds. Uh, and then in terms of just deployment goals and otherwise, uh, it was an incredible boon on the market for many years with private equity you know, raising fund after fund after fund and quickly deploying it. But uh, private equity has lagged the overall you know, buyer mix uh, year to date, 23 compared to last year. And I think that that's because it's easier to veto and say no uh, at investment committee to a deal in this market, given the you know, number of cross currents. But our view is there's pressure. Uh, on the private equity firms to start deploying money. And uh, that's coming from the LPs, that's coming from uh, the investment committees that are you know, eager to get back to work and doing deals. And there's an incredible amount of private equity owned portfolio companies that have delayed their uh, return to the market. So we're expecting that all of this should you know, break loose and, and uh, pose a, a fantastic 2024 for the private equity community. And have you seen any shifts in strategy from the private equity world as far as if they can't find the opportunities in the sector they could before where it was larger larger assets they might be dipping down into smaller type of companies because they can't get the debt or the equity support so they can maybe have smaller check sizes are they doing anything along those lines to get a little bit creative and think of other pockets um, of the market that they can capitalize on right now Sure. Well, we're seeing a couple of things. We're seeing larger sponsors play down and you know, take the financing out of the equation and use that as a competitive advantage uh, to you know, have certainty uh, and be aggressively deploying capital. We've seen more partnership deals when there is a concern about the size of the check uh, relative to the fund uh, and the rest of the portfolio where uh, one or two um, firms will you know, either proactively ask if they can partner up or we will help uh, create partnership situations to you know, de-risk some of uh, those investments. We're seeing the private equity community revisit the uh, deals that hadn't closed 
uh, but we're perhaps outperforming as others have mentioned and try to do one-off situations to take uh, the you know, auction process and uh, disparity between buyer and seller expectations off the table and just have um, you know peer-to-peer -peer conversations about that. So yes, we are seeing a lot of creativity as people try to get back uh, back at it and put money to work. It definitely seems like there's interest at all levels, but just trying to find those opportunities. Right. Um, and let's see. So maybe we can talk for a moment about the the debt side of it. Christine, you spoke about this a little bit, but has the fundraising environment, in your opinion, had an impact on how these um, trades are actually uh, transacting? Yeah. So um, on the credit side, uh, I guess just more specifically when it comes to doing the senior debt deals or the unit tranche deals, uh, you know, we haven't necessarily seen a lack of capital in the marketplace, um, but I do think there's an eye towards preserve, preservation so that if there is, um, and I think the fear is sort of abating now, but if there were to be a recession or if the portfolio did go into having higher default rates than, you know, what was predicted or expected, that there is some dry powder there reserved to support the portfolio rather than um, be deployed to new opportunities. So we've seen that exhibited in terms of having, you know, um, bite sizes are smaller, so more deals are having to be clubbed. Um, you know, underwriting capacity is down if still non-existent, so no one's really using their balance sheet um, the way they were before. Um, and so it's putting more uh, work on the sponsor's behalf to actually put those deals together. Um, in terms of uh, sort of more like the opportunity side of the equation, um, I think what I would, you know, might want to talk about this a little bit more because um, I'm going to maybe change the focus a bit. But again, it's this idea of structured capital. So a lot of the capital formation that we've seen on the, on the fundraising side have been around structured capital. Um, if you look at the big platforms, um, and big asset managers, they've all developed uh, special opportunity funds of, of some kind. Um, and even the private equity groups are starting to gravitate and fundraise around structured capital. And I think this is, you know, partly to address a gap in the marketplace, because when Unitron came in, it sort of, you know, was to the detriment of the mezzanine funds, the traditional unsecured subordinated notes, um, which was like a, more than a decade ago. But that junior capital was really hurt by the, uh, the sort of coming uh, of the unit tranche. And so now that we're sort of in, in the reverse side of that um, pendulum where it's swinging back the other way, there's been just a lack of junior capital. So we have, there's actually a lot of fund formation um, in and around structured capital. Can you maybe provide the audience some color on the difference between structured capital and then the other parts of the capital structure, maybe to give them some sense of what that difference, what, what the, um, the benefit of that is or what the assist is in providing yeah. that in addition to the regular unit tranche or regular way that yeah i mean in the old days so 12 months ago <laughs> we used to call structured capital um you know it was that capital that would come in, in in a distress situation or troubled situation and it's not that anymore it's actually being deployed in, in also very healthy situations again it's a, it's a junior piece of paper um the security will will sit with, behind the senior debt most often, but not always, will sit at the HOLCO level, not the operating company. And it's going to act and behave and feel like equity to the senior lender, but it doesn't require the sponsor to put more of their equity dollars in. So it still acts like leverage for them and helps to enhance returns. Um, so it's a hybrid security. It's, it's like a mid-teen return. Um, if it's a note, we typically see it you know, in the zone of a HOLCO pick note is what we call them. Um, which has a certain you know loan to value relationship in terms of how deep it will go, if it goes you know somewhat deeper than what a, a, a private credit platform who's doing Holco pick notes might like, it may flip to look something more like structured preferred equity. When you do it as a preferred equity tranche, there's like ten different ways you can um, structure that uh, piece of preferred, but it, it is essentially preferred equity. Um, but at the end of the day, both those um, you know hybrid classes of securities accomplish the same goal, which is uh, to provide more leverage to the sponsor to enhance returns, um, but feels and looks like equity to the senior debt so that you can access basically uh, more debt-like passive securities. Um, and so the using it has been um, really to delever balance sheets in this sort of 
broader environment, you know, a big theme is delevering transactions, whether it's a buying bill that's buying more EBITDA, um, if you do it with a note that sits at Holco, rather than debt at Opco, that to the senior lenders is viewed as a delevering uh, transaction. It's credit enhancing for them. Um, so, so it's not necessarily used um, to delever a troubled business. It's actually being used to delever growing businesses today that need to access some form of capital that isn't necessarily the sponsor's equity. And it's interesting to your point how um, it, depending on where you are in the market and if you are in a cycle that these different types of structures kind of come in and out of favor um, mm -hmm. and do support right. different types of strategies. So we've seen a lot of Correct. those actually in our business as well lately. Um, and so now we're going to turn a little bit, uh, change the, the backdrop a little bit and flip to Amy Peters, who is our legal representative on the call. A lot of questions have come about um, because of the environment that we're in and because of the way businesses have performed. Many have strongly performed throughout COVID, um, but obviously there are many challenges both um, externally and internally because of the environment that we've been working in. A lot of questions have been around um, restructurings and defaults and predictions along those lines, as well as documentation, particularly as the market seems to ebb and flow uh, in the favor of the borrower and the lender. So Amy, if you can just lay it all out for us and give us some sense for sure. how things have changed in the past, um, who's in charge and what kind of things, what are some of the terms people are highly focused on? Absolutely. So look, I think consistent with um, what my fellow panelists are seeing, I think for the A plus deals, the deals that are getting done, signed and closed that are, that are great, the terms aren't materially different from um, 2021, 2022, we're starting with those precedent credit agreements. And then I think, you know, all of my clients are super focused on a few issues. And the first one that comes up sort of liability management transactions, CERTA, minority lender protection. So that's always top of mind. And I think if you have a wish list of five things, that's definitely on it that you're changing in a precedent document or you're fighting for, even in an A plus deal. Um, I think lenders are also right now really focused still on, you know, on any deal on cash leakage to unrestricted subs to non guarantor subs and so really trying to get overall caps on what can go out of the system. Um, I've seen a big focus on and some success, you know, not across the board, but definitely some success. Um, we think about debt incurrence and incremental debt. I still think you're seeing 100% um, EBITDA green clear baskets and strong MFN pricing protection and terms protections, but an increased focus on priming debt, you know, debt that can be incurred at non-loan party subsidiaries or um, on non-collateral assets. So really looking at what can get, um, what can really be incurred outside of your lender group, um, your subsidiary group. Um, and then on EBITDA, I think we touched on this a little bit. I think everyone's looking again at share caps and those levels maybe bringing them in, maybe not, maybe bringing in the unusual non-recurring um, basket, which is typically uncapped, so we can get a shared um, or a, a sub cap on that. I think I've seen a lot of um, uh, focus there. And then additionally, I see the run rate realization period has been coming in. You're really not seeing like 36 months to realization anymore. And um, lenders are taking a second look at revenue synergies, given that we've had to live with those this year and, and, and seeing the impact on compliance certificates. And then I think on a new ask that we've seen on new deals, um, we've the borrowers are really asking for the ability to convert cash interest to pick interest to be a required lender vote versus an all lender vote. Uh, definitely met with uh, strong resistance, I think, from the lender community, but I expect given the uh, interest rate environment, that request will persist. Uh, so I think, look, it's a spectrum on who has the upper hand, depending on the deal and the sponsors. I think there are sort of lower middle market, um, riskier deals getting done, but your list of ask and how that deal is going to be structured is going to be a little longer than maybe those five items could be more like 15 uh, to make the documentation make sense for the underwriting. Then uh, just turning a little bit to asking about, uh, I think you asked a little bit about like default rates and restructurings and on the default rates, it's interesting to kind of predict obviously that they'll increase, but given the covenant light deals and the covenant wide deals and squishy EBITDA definitions, I think the default rate um, doesn't really reflect necessarily the health of companies. Uh, we're seeing borrowers run out of money far before they hit a financial covenant default or some other default. So I think that's really where we're seeing um, people have to come to the table right now. And that's where amendment activity is picking up. So we've seen definitely some 
um, financial covenant defaults. And in those situations, we're seeing sponsors and borrowers largely come to solutions um, that include putting in more equity for some type of covenant relief that lasts for four to six to eight quarters uh, versus forcing, forcing any type of sale or bankruptcy filing. And then the other amendment activity we see a lot similar to what Christine was talking about is the structured capital. So trying to get something done that the senior lenders will permit um, in the form of maybe a second lien pick or a preferred um, structure so they can complete add-on acquisitions. Um, and then I think just our view on restructurings as they go on is that it's gonna be a lot more of the same um, given the rise of the Unitron structure, with, um, which is higher leverage um, and smaller lenders. It seems that the companies don't need to go into bankruptcy as much. There's not as much benefit and it's very expensive. So we think there'll be a lot of out-of-court restructurings where lenders decide whether to um, sort of take the keys in a debt to equity conversion or potentially um, liquidate the company or you know do a sale process. That's kind of our view on maybe what's going to happen in the next six months. And do you see a lot of sponsors or borrowers asking for portability concepts right now? No, not in the last year, I would say. I haven't really seen any of that in the pure middle market. And how about, we We were pretty pleasantly surprised during COVID when we were working with our sponsors that they that they would shoulder the burden in a distress situation as much as they would ask of the lenders. Have you felt, has that um, sentiment stayed the same? Do you feel like the sponsors are still staying supportive and engaged with their assets? Or have you seen any shift in the, um, the behavior from that standpoint? I think it depends on the asset. I think if they believe in the story, they're very supportive and cooperative. I think, but there's plenty of deals, I think, where sponsors are starting to walk away and they don't see a recovery um, in sight. Which could be an interesting opportunity, I guess, on the back end for other sponsors to pick up right. some, some value deals. <laughs> Thank you. And then we're going to move once again along to um, private credit with Christine, which we've talked about this in bits and pieces, but maybe to bring it full circle, Christine, if you want to talk about a little bit more um, to bring it all together, the different types of capital structures that people have been putting in place as they get a little bit more creative, given the environment that we're in with um, the higher interest rates and the leverage profiles and trying to support a business uh, with a certain enterprise value, maybe you can share what, uh, what you guys have been experiencing or um, helping to create or build. Yeah, um, and maybe taking a step back and picking up on something that Maria said, which is distributions back to LPs. Um, you know, as, as the velocity of M&A has slowed and the velocity, right, um, of return of capital to the LPs is concurrently slowed. Um, there has been a tremendous amount of pressure in the market for sponsors to return capital to um, to their um, to their LPs. Um, but historically, because you know it was just easy money for the longest time, everyone just ran ran processes and did full exits. Um, right, but now I think what we're starting to see and the evolution of the marketplace, and you're seeing a lot more in, in the upper. Uh, market and it, it will eventually make its way into the sort of traditional middle market private deals too. Um, but this idea that you don't actually have to do a full exit um, and you can you can just relever the business. Um, and so again, historically, everyone just did dividend recaps, right? To just return money when a company had delevered enough um, rather than maybe exit if you felt you, you had some more runway and value to add to that business as a, as a GP. Um, now, with this, so the advent of structured capital, um, there's a much broader spectrum of things you can do to create distributions back to your LPs without it being a full exit. And so if you think about recapitalizations, now you can use, again, structured capital to sort of walk your way down that capital structure um, to help, um, you know, create a partial liquidity event rather than a full liquidity event. Um, and it can go all the way through and what we're seeing are sort of shared control or co-control deals where sponsors are, you know, there's a selling sponsor that will sell 50% of its um, equity holdings to another sponsor that'll come in to own the other 50 and they'll, they'll share control, um, which is something you, ne you didn't really see before and you're seeing a lot more today and I think you'll continue to see a lot more of it. Um, because if you really think about what's happening with the multiple compressions is that while there's a lot of pressure to buy, um, there's, and there's a, on the flip side with the, the LPs, there's a lot of pressure to sell. The truth of the matter is taking two turns of multiple compression 
on a company that maybe performed okay, but not to your underwriting case, is likely going to ret return something that's suboptimal for you to raise your next fund. Um, and so rather than sell the business and record suboptimal outcomes, which over the longer term is going to create another issue for you as a sponsor, but you still believe you can add value to that company, you're going to lengthen your hold and you're going to try and find another way to sort of live another day with that asset. And so you, so, and that's why we see a lot of structured capital being used to, to do dividend recapitalizations. Um, all, and we call a co-control, that's sort of the extreme case. It's the bookend of what you can do using structure. So that, that is probably the, the biggest sort of forward trend I would predict is um, as you continue to see the market shift and evolve, that while the A assets will sell and people will get their returns, there's going to be that average company. You know, you underwrote with double EBITDA. It didn't double. It just grew by 50%, which is still really good. In the old world, you would have sold it and still made your return. In this new world, you can't, you can't sell it anymore. You have to think of something else. And so that's why recapitalizations are going to probably be a, a, a replacement um, to the traditional sale. And then have you kind of, oh, go. I was just going to say to that point, we've also seen quite a bit of activity for from our GP solutions team on continuation right. vehicles. And they've run the gamut of the best assets that are being put into vehicles. They've been stripped based on an investment theme. They've been a cleanup of old, old funds, but that team is extremely active right now. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, Maria, because that's that's exactly right. So you can you can work your way through the company's balance sheet. And then when you, you know, then you've got, um, other solutions that are at the fund level. So you could do NAV loans against the fund to return capital. It used to be that NAV loans, you used to do it on old funds that had, had three or four assets left in them and you were trying to save one of the companies. Now they're being used to, over very healthy funds that are just looking to create distributions. You can do LP secondaries, right? Where new LPs come into a fund and take out old LPs. There's so many things you can do now, even at an LP level. It isn't just at the company level. Um, that are just all all ways to create distributions um, that are alternatives to a full sale. We've seen a, a variety of um, continuation vehicles be put in place as well with some other transactions with add-on activity in conjunction with a fund going into a continuation vehicle. I think exactly to your points of they're trying to continue to build upon the, the, the strategy or the thesis that they have in place, but they don't want to they may not get the value that they thought they could get in the marketplace maybe 12 months ago. Um, they may have tested the market and tried to get a valuation and certainly got a decent valuation relative to what um, the market would be on average, but thought they could get something better. So want to hold on to that asset for a little bit longer, make a few more acquisitions, see some of the integration play out. So going back to the, um, the questions of the true EBITDA and the synergies that are working their way through the numbers. And so there's certainly um, a lot of those types of transactions that we're seeing come through um, with our book of business right now at Churchill as well. The other thing I was going to mention too, Christine, on um, on the debt side is we're seeing asks for some pick interest on senior debt. I don't know if you've had any type of situations like that where you've had either proposals to do that as valuations might be um, going back up and if the lender or the uh, sponsor and borrower wants to get debt that might be back to the levels before whatever you want to call this environment that we're in today, but the company may not be able to support the same level of debt because of the high um, SOFR rates. So we're getting some questions or some requests for pick interest on senior loans, which is newer to us, but I don't know if you've seen more of that um, based on your capital raising activity. Uh, not in an actual deal closing. <laughs> uh, but that works, right? We've seen it in amendments to Amy's earlier point. We've seen it in amendments where a company's having either a hiccup or some longer term issue where they need to sort of preserve cash, but, but we have yet to see pick in a meaningful way. Now, do you see a point here or there? Maybe. Do you see it when, well, you do have the trend where you might have a large unit tranche lender who will actually go in and take up some of that structured capital. And so they might go deeper and then we'll try and mimic um, what it would have otherwise have been, it have been, you know, what the company could support on a fixed charge basis and then pick the rest. So you'll see it in some of the structured deals um, where they just structure their way into a fixed charge that works, but, but not in a traditional sense on your average deal. Yeah, thank you. So in summary, there's been a lot that's happened um, in the past nine months. It's hard to believe it's already the end of the third quarter and we're entering the fourth quarter. 
But as Maria mentioned at the outset of this call, even when we had our prep call only three weeks ago, it seems like the sentiment has really shifted um, from something that was a little bit more cautious and perhaps not as positive to being, I think, a lot more positive. There's a lot more activity out there. There are lenders and sponsors alike who want to put money to work. So just to wrap it up, I'd like to get a sense for what you guys are thinking. Um, what is the outlook for the rest of this year as we head into the fourth quarter and then maybe even into next year? Do you think, will there be something that will happen that will cause the floodgates to open? I will say my joke is always um, many investment bankers made promises since last Labor Day that there was this huge um, pipeline and backlog of deals that were going to come to the market. And I think those are finally coming to the market, which has been great um, for everybody. And then my question too would be, are, is there anything that's going to make deals close by the end of the year? Or will we hopefully have a nice pipeline going into the new year? So maybe going back to Chris Ann, so we haven't heard from you for a little bit, maybe let us know what your thoughts are as we wrap up the year and look into next year. Yeah, I, I think uh, I agree with what Maria said. We've definitely been out um, at more pitches just even in the last several weeks with very healthy companies and a lot of private sellers as well that have been sitting on the sidelines, maybe even since pre-COVID, that are feeling ready to go. Most of those I think we're going to see at you know in 2024, Jessica. I feel like the companies that we've seen the uptick, you know, if they're coming to market, the ones that are coming to market now, I don't think there's a rush that has to get done by year end. I think what we've seen that processes are taking longer. I think the ones that are coming to market now, they will, you know, people want to be, you know, handle the process carefully, make sure they can maximize valuation in terms. So I don't feel like there's a rush that anything has, there's nothing pressing that they have to be done by this year. But I do feel that, um, look, I don't want to be one of those makes those promises either. But in terms of timing, I don't know if the floodgates, I don't see them opening completely in Q4, but I do think you're going to see more quality deals in Q1. Because I think the one thing we hear from a lot of corporates and private equity, the quality has been really off this year. And now they're starting to hear more conversations from bankers of really nice quality companies that I think that either private equity groups, private sellers or corporates are feeling that they can get the valuation that they feel the companies uh, deserve or they perform. They can see the how they performed in a very difficult and challenging 2023. That's a great point. Maria, do you have anything to add to that? Well, at Baird, we had a record number of pitches in August. So, <laughs> so fingers crossed that the market behaves and we can bring those out. Uh, but we are playing for 2024. So assume yep. most of that will be in prep uh, through the rest of the year. But we do have our what we're calling shadow backlog, largest shadow backlog ever. So in addition to our, our things in active prep that are engaged, we have the entire backlog of things that were on hold pending market conditions. So we're expecting to buckle up for 24. Hopefully that plays out. Janica. I completely agree. I think that we've heard a lot about this post Labor Day deal come to market in 4Q that's just not happening this year. And it does feel like there is activity, but it's quite lumpy. And I definitely wouldn't characterize the so-called market as being all out right now. So it does feel like a lot of that is rolling into 2024. I think what's so tricky is if you think about this need for liquidity for the private equity and LP community that Maria talked about and the backlog that's out there versus what's still a bit of an uncertain market, it's kind of like, OK, is this a gradual return or is this the 2021 ambush? And I actually think that Christine summed it up really well in saying that what is happening and and I think may continue to happen, we can no crystal ball, is that the A businesses will continue to sell, but there will be this whole other business of this creative structuring, partial exits, deals that just look different than, you know, 80 to 100 percent M&A that will actually make the market quite busy. It just will look a little different. Amy, it sounds like your restructurings will turn into brand new LBOs. That's what, that's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping all these people are right and we'll be we'll be really busy in 2024. <laughs> Christine, did you have anything else to add to that? Uh, you know, I'm always the the one with the black cloud over my head. So I actually think as long as the interest rates are going to hold, which the yield curve says it's going to hold for a while, I mean, to me, that's just a deceleration of the money multiplier. And that's what we're experiencing right now. And sort of this idea that magically we're just going to be going gangbusters is just not consistent with, you know, economic theory 101, which I guess I was listening in that class when I was taking it in college. But uh, to me, this is just a function of, um, you know, the Fed's taking money out of the system and just the money multiplier effect slowing every every asset class down 
to what is actually normal because the last decade was not normal. <laughs> that, that was the anomaly. What's normal is what we're, I think, experiencing now for those of you who are in my age group and um, we're doing this, you know, started like 20 years ago. This is, this is more reasonable and normal. And I think the market just has, the psychology of the market is just adjusting now to that, the normal. And I think that's a great point. It does seem like there there has been a lot of ups and downs. There's been a lot that we've had to survive through and here we are. And it almost seems like this is, we've gotten into a new rhythm um, and have found some pretty creative and constructive ways to make deals happen um, and be supportive and deploy capital both on the private equity and on the lending side. So um, I think I, my view is too, I, I don't think there's anything that's gonna actually trigger an event that makes things go super busy, but it does seem like we're at a pretty nice pace and have gotten into a pretty a good cadence um, and the deal flow has been around. And we're really excited to keep working with all of you and hopefully have a nice end of the year and a, a healthy backlog as we enter into 2024. So with that, I wanna thank each and every one of you for your time here. This has been really helpful and I think very eye-opening. I hope it's been great for our audience to hear the perspectives from all the different angles and all the different sectors um, and the challenges and the ups and downs that we've experienced. But hopefully, like I said, we're into a, a new normal that we're getting used to and we'll figure out the best ways to uh, continue to work together and get some, some great deals done. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.